so many times Paul uses Hebraism, and I believe in either tonight's lesson or tomorrow he's going to use this. And if you don't know Hebrew, you really sometimes miss what Paul's saying. Because he does refer, use a lot of Hebraisms, and not only Paul does, but the what person in the New Testament uses more Hebraisms than anyone else? Which one is it? Paul. What was the question again? Who in the New Testament of the New Testament writers uses more Hebraisms than anyone else, especially in one book? Paul, No. With John. John in the book of Revelation, especially. All right. Now, as you look up here, you see Aleph, okay? And over to the right of that, you see that is the, uh, the horns of an ox is what it's talking about. Okay? And then we have Beth. And uh, Beth is either a, 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 it can be a B or a V sound, okay? But the <coughs> idea of, of Beth is house, Okay? And what city, New Testament city, and even Old Testament city, is named with that Beth in it? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. All right. Bethlehem. All right. What does Bethlehem mean? House of bread. Thank you, young lady. You're just right on the ball. House of bread. All right. And Gamil. And you look at what it looks like over here, and then it's like camel. Okay? Camel. And then we have down the left, and that is door. Okay? And then we have hay. And that is window, light, or breath. And remember, in the Old Testament, uh, Abraham, his name was Abram, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And what, what letter did God add to his name? H. H, or the heth. Which, see what it is? It means life or breath. He was too old to bring forth a child. But God added life and breath to him, and he brought forth a child. It was a promised child. He had a child before. As a matter of fact, he had many children after that. He had a mess of kids, didn't he? Abraham did, but they were not of the prom. There was only one promised son. Okay? Well, anyway, you look on down there, and you can see all of these things, but I thought I'd share that with you because tonight or tomorrow night we're going to run into one of these Hebrew letters, so we have to understand it. Okay? All right. Ephesians 5.13. Ephesians 5.13. Ephesians 5.13. Ta. Ta. De. Ponta. Ponta. Alex Colmena. Alex Colmena. Hippo. Hippo. Two. Two. Photos. Photos. Fano Rute. Fano Rute. All right. Now let's look at this. <clears throat> now, this is a continuation of what we've been talking about. Remember all the hard preaching that we got so far? We got beat over the head with, with uh, all kinds of things. Walk as children of light. And he's continuing that on. He tells us to walk as children of light. And one uh, writer once said, Sin in the life of a believer is different than sin in the life of an unbeliever. He said in capital letters, it is worse. It is worse. A child of God, sin in your life looks ten times worse than it does in anybody else's life, doesn't it? Then it is. A Christian is not sinless. We know that because we are Christians, okay? And But as as we surrender our lives to God, as time goes on, we sin a little less and a little less and a little less. I think sometimes sin wears us out. We begin to realize that sin is not good at all. <clears throat> also, as we look at this verse, it says, And the things all, elexo menach. Now, this word, elexomena, means to reprove with the Word of God to the point of repentance. It means to preach God's Word. To preach God's Word. Sometimes it's easy to preach it, and sometimes it's hard to preach it. As simple as that. When you preach God's Word, you reprove to the point of repentance, hopefully, 
the lost. Hmm. Well, that's what we call evangelism. When you preach God's word, how does it affect the saved? <clears throat> enriches. It enriches and cleanses their lives and their minds. <clears throat> okay? It enriches and cleanses their minds. How about the community where you live? Does your church, does, does your church that you're a member of have an effect upon the community? Does the words, I hope, that the words that I preach here tonight affect this community. That's right. It has got to affect the community. I wrote down here, the preacher of the word is responsible to turn the light on the sins of individuals in his church. And sometimes the community and even the nation. We need to tell the truth. We need to preach the Word of God. And when you see people become becoming, let's look at this word. Alexco is what it is. Alexco. It's nominee, plural, neuter. All right. Being convinced. Present participle and passive voice. It means something is changing people. The preaching of the Word of God does change lives, doesn't it? The Bible is a powerful book. When you open it up, it's not just words on a paper. It's not just words. It's not like a newspaper. You can go and read the newspaper every day. And Bakersfield, California is trying to make their paper more readable, aren't they? That's what they say. You still throw it in the trash at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah, you still, no matter what. It's just a paper, it's just some news on it. But when we open the Bible, <clears throat> especially in the original languages, it affects our lives. Before I ever preach it, it affects my life. I have really uh, spent this last week uh, really working on this lesson. I, I, I have loved working on this lesson for you. But it works me over first, and then it works you over as I preach it to you. But it should, it says, by the ancient thea of the light, it is made manifest. The light we have is a contrast between good and evil. Jesus came to a, a people that did not want him. If he'd have given them everything they wanted, just like our children. If you give your children everything you want and say yes to them always, they'll always, they'll always want more. Why? They're looking for boundaries. <laughs> They're looking for boundaries. They want to know how far they can go. We have to show them what our boundaries is. Jesus, when he came into this world, he came into this world not looking for boundaries, but looking to save our wretched souls. He wasn't trying to find out what he could do and what he couldn't do. Uh, just think about God coming down here and, and dwelling among mankind. All kind of mischief that he could got into, huh? And you and some of the traditions that you read in some of this folklore about Jesus, he did get into mischief. You know, you might see some of that where he did little things and, and uh, pulled jokes on people because he was a creator, so-called. He didn't do that. Jesus came down here to give us a living example of what the real Word of God is like, what God is like. God dwelt and visited mankind. And by the Word of God that we have in the Old Testament that pointed to him and, and pointed to God's righteousness, Righteousness sheds light on sin, doesn't it? <clears throat> it does. Second Corinthians six fourteen through seven one, Romans sixteen and verse nineteen, second Corinthians four three and four, Ephesians four seventeen through nineteen, Matthew seven twenty one through twenty three, Romans thirteen, eleven through thirteen. 
1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 10, all of these relate to this one little short verse. No scripture is of any private interpretation. You've heard of that. Okay. No scripture is any private interpretation. If there's a scripture that stands out and you think that you have discovered something brand new and it's not confirmed by the rest of the Bible, you know what? Your idea is probably wrong. <laughs> it is. It's not of any private interpretation. So how many times is this scripture confirmed in all of these other places? Now 5 and verse 14. And by the way, 5 and verse 14 could part of this verse could have been an early hymn. Could have been an early hymn. They might have sang, sung this verse among the early churches. Pon, Gar, Gar To, Faneru Menon, Fos, Esten, Dio, Lege, Egaire, Ho, Kathudon, Kai, Anastoth, Ek, Ton, Necron, Kai, Epiphase, Su, or actually I think you should pronounce that C, Ho, Christos. What? I said there aren't even that many words in that verse. How'd you get so many words in? It, it is there. There's a lot of words and a lot of meaning in it. Isaiah 26 and 19. Isaiah 60 verse 1. And it, by the way, it's quoted out of there. Romans 13, 11 through 13, and 2 and 5, uh, 6 and 13. Acts uh, 16, 25, and 1 Timothy 3, 16, 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 14, John 15, 22, John 3, 19 through 21, Hebrews 4, 13, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Now these are just some of the places that is, it, it corresponds to this one verse. This is a gigantic verse. For every the things having been put in the light, it is, for he says, rise up, a God ray. Rise up. You uh, stand up. The one sleeping. All right? The one sleeping. Stand up, the one sleeping. He, uh, <clears throat> we get the idea... And we've always had the idea that when we fall asleep in death, our body falls asleep, doesn't it? It looks like it's sleeping and it lays down and it doesn't get back up. It's like it's motionlessly asleep. Well, one time, Jesus used this word, egyre, here. Remember what it was? What? Rise. Rise. He said rise. He spoke to someone. Lazarus, Lazarus raise up. And Paul is referring to that here in using this word. When he told Lazarus to raise up. Why did God raise Lazarus from the dead? Why did he do it? To show that he was Christ. God. That's right. You know, God loves, doesn't he? God has compassion, tremendous compassion for mankind. That's why he came down to the earth and dwelt among us. But God, as far as I can tell in the Bible, did not heal anyone because of compassion. It was all for a purpose. Everything God does is for a purpose. He did it for a purpose. Now, it's, it, I didn't say that he didn't love them. I didn't say that he didn't have compassion on them. But that wasn't the reason why he did. He healed ten lepers one time, didn't he? Yes. Hmm? He had ten lepers he healed. Why did he heal those ten lepers? Show that he was God. That's right, show he was God. That was uh, something that the Messiah would do. But now, what did a leper have to do when he saw somebody if he was out in public? 
call out unclean. Unclean, unclean. Don't come to me. Unclean, unclean. What did Jesus tell them to do? Go show, to the Go show yourself to the priest. You'll never have to call out unclean again. Remember one time when when uh, Peter was down on the the seashores of uh, of the Mediterranean Sea down there, and and God showed him a vision. He put a great big tablecloth out there, and on that tablecloth was what? All kinds of unclean. Food. All kinds of unclean animals. And here he used this word again. Raise up. Rise up. Arise and what? Eat. Eat. What did Peter say? I can't. I have never, not one unclean things have ever passed these lips, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a typical Jew, doesn't it? <laughs> unclean. Unclean. Those people that Jesus healed never had to say unclean again. The Lord told Peter when he said, Arise, slay, and eat. No way, Lord. And he said to him something very hard. He said, Never call common or unclean what I have cleansed. Arise. And what did he want him to do? Raise up and do what? Go minister to Cornelius. Go minister to a bunch of Gentiles like us. There's not, I don't guess there's a Jew in here tonight. I mean, sometimes I have Jews in my class, but right now, I don't think we got a Jew here. And it's because of what Peter did right there and what God showed him. What Don't say what's common and unclean. Us Gentiles were always looked upon as dogs. Hippies. <laughs> All right. My... Mean uncle had a dog named Tippy. That dog would bite you if you got a chance. <laughs> Don't call us dogs anymore. Don't you call them unclean. What I've cleansed is cleansed. And they get up there and go to the house of Cornelius and Priestum. And all of them were saved. Rise up. <clears throat> Quit sleeping. The one sleeping. Present participle active, nominee, singular, masculine. Wake up, get out, Kai, Anasta. Second person singular, secondary, imperative active, Anasta. That comes from Anna and histamine, doesn't it? Huh? Anna and histamine. God wants us to stand up and be resurrected out of the sin that we had before. Stand up. Walk off from it and leave it behind. That's what was taking you to hell, so leave it there. It belongs there. Raise up the one sleeping. Can a child of God sleep? Can you just lay down and become lothful sometimes? Slothful? You know what sloth does? How many of you ever seen a sloth? He hangs around his toes. He hangs around in trees, doesn't he? But what does he do? Not much. Not much. Whatever he does, it he does it slowly. <laughs> That's one of the ways he protects himself. They think he's part of the thing. He just just barely just moves so slow. You ever seen anybody move like that? <laughs> you got some employees. Don't you? <laughs> You've had some employees that were slow. Well, where am I, you, brother? Not anymore. Oh, okay. You had some. Past tense, huh? Okay. Stand up. Well, what do you think the God, uh, God thinks about us slothful employees, so to speak? God says, get up. Get up. Out from among the dead ones. Ectone necro. The dead ones. Get out. Get out from among the dead ones. We were once part of that dead world, weren't we? Don't go waller back in it. Just get out of it. Get out and away from it. And, Kai, Epiphase. And he shall shine upon you. If you do the will of God, you will 
become some little kid's hero. Won't you? Sometimes that happens. You might even become your wife's hero. <laughs> That's right. Maybe. Who's your hero, Mary? <laughs> <laughs> I'm her hero. Right now, right now, I'm her hero. <laughs> you get home. <laughs> well, we ought to be. You know, every every husband ought to be the hero in his life. Ought to be the hero in your family. The hero. You ought to be the hero of your children. The protector and the hero. And then it says, the Christ. He shall shine upon you, the Christ. <clears throat> Light produces goodness. Did you know that? Light produces goodness. In uh, Hebrews 4.13, let's go there. Hebrew, someone have the book of Hebrews? You got it there, Brother Harold? Uh, yeah. All right. You got the book, don't you? Oh yes. You got the book. That's good. Hebrews four thirteen. All right. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we will have to do. That's right. In other words, all things are manifest to God, and that's what it says here. All things are manifest to God. Now John three nineteen through twenty one. John the third chapter. 19 through 21. John 3, 19 through 21. Let's look at some of these comparative left uh, verses here. Go ahead, Brother Harry. And this is the judgment that the light is coming to the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For anyone who does evil, hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, that his de deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. All right. When you do anything good, it is of God. It is of God. Good produces goodness. All right. 5.15. Here we have some very interesting words. In this verse, blepete, un, akribos, akribos, pos, peripatete, peripatete, me, pos, asophic poi, Allah, pos, sophoi. All right. Take heed, or ye look. Third, second person plural present is actually imperative active, and it comes from blepo. Blepo means I see. Okay? You see to it, therefore, carefully. This is a this is quite a word here. There's an English word that comes from this word, akribos. What in the world do you think it might be, akribos? What do you think? Acrobat. 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 How many of you ever gone to a circus or a carnival and watch acrobats? What do they do? They almost defy gravity. They almost defy gravity. What is it done by? How is this done? By training. By extreme amount of training. All right? Acrobats. They do things accurately. Okay? We get a word acrobat right straight out of this Greek word. Uh, have, have you ever seen them? people stand and make a pyramid? How long, how many hours do you think it took to do that? My daughter's chicken took quite a few hours. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. How about any type of skating on ice? It takes practice, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. All right. Even throwing a disc takes practice. How about how about these you know, the other yes, Brother John. Tightrope. What? A tight walking a tightrope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, walking a tightrope. People I've I've seen back in the old in the early days, people used to stretch in New York City they would stretch ropes 
between buildings. And they walk between those buildings. Mm -hmm. With no net down below. How do you think they walk? Very carefully. Carefully. <laughs> All right, carefully. All right. How should we walk in this world? Very carefully. Very carefully. Why? So we glorify God. So we can glorify God with our lives. We need to walk carefully. Matthew 2 and 8, Luke 1 and 3, Matthew 10, 16, Colossians 4 and 5, Ephesians 5 and 2. These are all verses that correspond with this one. We get the word circumspect. It comes from two Greek words, or two Latin words. Kerka and spectre. And we talked about this word just a little bit Sunday, didn't we? What does that mean? Well, to look around. What was our first word here? Blepete. You look around. Pay attention. And how are we supposed to pay attention? Carefully. How? Peripatete. How do, how do you do what? Well, How is that? Peri means around and patio means to walk. What's the word for Spanish and for foot? To walk? Nobody knows. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Comes right straight out of this word, too. The short form of it. To walk around accurately and carefully. Why? Why? Why do you think the man walked between two buildings carefully 500 feet off the ground? So, because he could. Well, because his life depends on the accurately oh, yeah. Whose life depends on your accurately, of you walking in this world? My life. Your life, for one. Christ in you. Your children. Your family depend on you. Don't they? Your neighborhood depends on you. Your community depends on you. Your state commends on you depends on you, and your nation depends on you, what you do. Remember the last one we looked about? When the God's Word is preached, what happens? People are changed, communities are changed, states are changed, counties are changed. The whole nation sometimes is changed. Have you ever heard of real Christian nations? Sometimes, real ones, real Christian nations. You go back and look at church history. We haven't had any of those lately. <laughs> but there were some. I'm going to tell you something. The Mennonites had a lot to do with that wherever they were. People trusted them. You know why? Because they were trustworthy. How about the Amish? You ever hear anybody being an Amish being dishonest? Not for long. <laughs> Walk around not as a sophoi. <clears throat> a sophoi. Or sophi. What does asophoi mean? Unwise. Remember what the word Sophia means? Remember Sophia Lauren, that name? You ought to get that word uh, uh, corresponding to the word that means to be beautiful in spirit. That word, that wisdom, that you can take everything and every circumstance in this world and bring it to the glory of God. That is the purpose. But what does this one mean here? It means the opposite. No matter what circumstance you're in, this one here makes you look like a fool. But as wise, ones with wisdom, beautiful, Ones with wisdom. Go on a little bit further. 5.16. Ex agorazo minoi. Ex agorazo That's a long word, isn't it? Ex agorazo minoi. That's easy to say, even though it's long. Tone. Cairo. Cairo. Hote. Hey. Hemere. Onerai, Essen. Yes. 
Exodus 20 and verse 7. When I was talking Sunday morning, I was talking a little bit about our lesson tonight. Exodus 20 and verse 7. Someone go to the book of Exodus. It comes from two Greek words, ek and hodos. It means the road out or the way out. Okay? And in the Old Testament, the Old Testament, most of the books in the Old Testament were not named after the, the Hebrew, but from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew, and that's where they got their names. Okay? Uh, Brother Harold, what does that say there? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. All right. Sunday morning, do you remember what I said about this verse? What was the Hebrew, what was the rabbi's interpretation of this verse? Remember that? They, we use this word, we don't supposed to use the Lord's name in vain. Huh? Well, they said not to use Jehovah. Uh, but uh, the Lord's name in vain is Avani. We can't speak the name Jehovah. I mean, we do it all the time, but really that's an unspeakable name of God. We can't say Lord or, or just God, whatever we want to. And people that do that, we call them, they're, they're uh, guilty of blasphemy, aren't they? Okay? But what do the Hebrews say? What do the rabbis, how do they interpret this, this verse of Scripture? And I think it's the right way to interpret here. Was Paul a rabbi? Yes. He sure was, wasn't he? Now let's get back. Now I told you about Hebraism and thing, and he is going. To, he's bringing up the Hebraism right here. All right, he's bringing up the Hebraism. He's going back, uh, buying out, buying out off the slave market, is what it means. Buying out the kairos. All right, kairos is, and chronos are two different words. Chronos means time in Greek, and kairos actually means. It's got the idea of the time, but it means season. Season. Redeeming, buying back. How many times, did, how much of your life was wasted? Most. How many of us have wasted most of our lives? Hmm. All right. Wasted it. How would you like to be able to buy some of it back? Redeeming the time. Redeeming the seasons. The Hebrew idea of using the, name, the Lord's name in vain, every time a proselyte came to Israel, they were baptized, and they named the name of God. By the God of this people, I will follow. What did Ruth say when she decided to follow Naomi back to the land of Israel? Your God will be my God. All right? When we name the name of God, we ought to follow that name and we ought to follow that God. The rabbi said, if you don't make good use of your time, good use of your life, after that you have named the name of the God, you're guilty of using his name in vain. That's how the rabbis interpreted that scripture. Now, looking at this scripture, we need to buy back some time. How, you know, praise God when someone's saved when they're seven or eight years old, huh? And they walk in the Lord all of their lives. That's what you want for your children. If you got any sense, you, you want that. You want them to be saved when they're young. You want them to be follow the Lord and, and just go on through life without all of the hardships that that life can bring you out there in the world, all the hard knocks of the world. You don't want your children to have to go through those hard knocks. But how about if you wasted 70 years of your life and you only had one year to go? There's a story about that in Matthew, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Do something. The talents, remember the talents, remember the sower that went forth to sow all of the parables. What are you supposed to do with your life when God calls you and redeems you? He buys you off the slave market, doesn't he? It's supposed to work uh, for him. Huh? Work for him. Yeah. You work for him. Not because you have to, but because you want to, because you're thankful. 
thankful. That's what James will tell us, isn't it? Yeah, that's what James is going to tell us. Mm -hmm. I tell you what, that's what Philemon tells us too. Philemon is a beautiful little book. I may preach Philemon by way of of uh, the book of James. I may do Philemon first. It's not going to be a long book. But I have got that one on my heart. <laughs> because it's beautiful. We need a little beauty also. A little beauty. Buying out, redeeming, buying back some of the some of the seasons that you've lost because the days ponere. Perverted. We live in a perverted world, don't we? Oh, I, I look at this country sometimes and it's so ungodly. The whole sense of value is ungodly. Get and get and get and get and have the selfishness of this mindset in this country. Mine! The early churches would be aghast at what these church members here do. Boy, we live in evil times. They are evil. This uh, natural evil, Adamic evil, is cockles. That's this word right here. That's just, that's Adamic. And what do we mean by Adamic? That's just something you're born into. That's sin. something that you're born into sin. You're born into it. You're born into cockles. But I'm going to tell you something. You've really got to twist things to get polarity on. That is practiced evil. And the world is getting real good at that too, aren't they? We talked about, what kind of evils have we talked about so far? Immorality, drunkenness, gambling. Well, they ever one of them is evil. Immorality, drunkenness, gambling, trying to get something. That's greed, isn't it? Greed in God's book is the same as what? Idolatry. Bowing down to an idol because it is greed. Things can become our idols. Dia Tuto. 517. May. May. Ganeste. Ganeste. Athrones. Ala. Sinete. Ti. To. Galima. Tu. Kudio. If you go back to Ephesians, the first chapter, it's so beautiful. It tells us about the mind of God in Ephesians, the first chapter. I just love to read it in Greek. It is beautiful. I, don't know, I could go back and further the book. Paulus Apostles, Christu, Esu, Dia, De La Matos. The you, tois hagios, tois usen in epusu, kaipis tois in Christu isu, caris himen, kai ereni apotheo, patros himon, kai kirio esus Christu. There's one word here that stands out so great to me. It sets the lamatos up there. Paul, <coughs> apostle Christ Jesus, by the thelamatos, the you, by the spiritual activating force of God. That word fellow means I wish or I will. Fellow is I wish. The spiritual activating force of God. What a, what a word that we got here. Because of this, not ye keep on becoming. Middle voice, by the way. What was the most dangerous gift God gave man? Volition. There we have this rascal. Volition. Because of this, why do you keep on becoming athrones? Remember one of the one of the, the several words for mind in Greek is what? 
brain. That's what this word comes from, brain. So what are we talking about with this? Why do you keep on becoming brainless, mindless? Why are we mindless? He said for us to be Sophia. That's another word for mind, okay? Another word for mind. What's another word? We got our word knowledge from it, from it, gnosko, or nome. That's something we can learn. This word brain here, brain is horse sense. Remember? What is horse sense? Common sense. Common sense. Why don't you have any common sense? Why do you keep on being brainless? Why do you keep on being without any common sense at all? Look at us. Look at our lives. When we're born in this world, we are cockos, Adamically bad. We're born into sin. We have that spirit of rebellion in us. And I keep drawing this little thing on the board, and I really, I want you to learn this by heart. Okay? Spirit, mind, our soul. All right? And then we have body. We're triune. When we're born into this world, we're born with this spirit of rebellion in us, don't, aren't we? Brother Harold, you ever been acquainted with that spirit out there in those public schools, brother? <laughs> huh? Oh my. I tell you what. Teenagers test every generation of mankind since Adam. It has. I think maybe when Cain killed Abel, he was a teenager. <laughs> they, teenagers test every generation. They do. Because they're brainless. <laughs> we, have, we, we, we become brainless. But how many times in our lives, as we see people, do you think you have to teach a child to be bad? No. You can raise them up in the most wonderful home. And I guarantee you they can go astray. You teach them to do wrong. You teach them to lie. You teach them to, teach them to cheat, cheat and to steal. And you know what they're going to be most of the time? They're going to be real efficient at it. They're going to be real good at it. They'll be real good at it. And they'll be practiced at it. And why do we cheat, lie, and steal most of the time? Greed. And what is greed? It's idolatry. Wrong. Stop becoming foolish. But, that word all of there, that's a strong adversity conjunction. But, sinete. Sinete. Now what does this word sinete mean? Sin means what? We get our word sin, that type of sin, or sometimes it's used like that. It means alike? Yeah, alike. All right? Or it means to be able to put things together. Understand. Don't be ignorant. Don't be foolish. Don't be brainless. Don't be unwise. Don't be without any common sense, but able to put your thoughts together. Just think. Realistically think. What? That's T. That's a little interrogative there. Tol thelema. What the... What, the, what was it in Ephesians 1 there? The spiritual activating force of God. Put together, understand what the spiritual activating force of Christ, of, of Kyrios. What is the Hebrew equivalent to Kyrios? See, we're studying Hebrew too. What's the Hebrew equivalent of it? Brother David, do you remember that? Hmm? Adonai. 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 What is Adonai? 
King of kings and Lord of lords. I want you to remember some of these words. They're really important, Brother David. How do you spell Adonai? Is it A-D-O-N? All right. Adonai. That's the equivalent in the Old Testament when they came to the name of Jehovah. If they were reading it, they would refer to that. Turn this fellow over. If it's a proper name, shouldn't it be a capitalized or no? Yeah, we can do that. Okay. That was my capital, but mm -hmm. cursive capital, all right. <laughs> Adonai, Lord. When Jesus' disciples referred to him, they referred to him, they, looked, they thought of his name as the Habashia. What's Hamashiach? The Messiah. Ha. Mashiach. Messiah. Alright? He was the Messiah. The Messiah. Ha means the Messiah. Okay? They looked at him as the Messiah. And if he was the Messiah, who was he? In the Old Testament, he was Jehovah. And how should they refer to him? And how did they refer to him? The, the Greek equivalent the one who shot was Kyrios. Kyrios. You'll go back in the Septuagint and every time they translate the word Adonai, they will translate him Lord or Kyrios. Alright? That ought to... I mean, every one of these things teaches something about the name of God. Okay? 517. 518. Alright? There were a lot of equivalents there. Colossians 1 and 9 and Romans 12 and 2 and 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3. Stop becoming foolish. Stop being brainless. 518. Kai. May. Mathis Keste. Mathis Keste. All right. Oino. Oino. N. Ho. Heston. Asotia. Allah. Play roll face. In Numate. Now this verse we could spend a whole night on to tell you the truth. Really, we can. Titus 1 and 6, 1 Peter 4 and 4, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 7, Proverbs 20 and verse 1, 23 and verse 31, Romans 13 and 13, 1 Corinthians 5 and 11. Uh, Brother Harold, do you can you go back to Ver Proverbs 20 and verse 1 and 23, verse 31 for me, please? We want to uh, to discover one of the greatest curses of mankind. What was that? Again? Proverbs, Proverbs 20. Uh, 20 and verse 1 and Proverbs 23 and verse 31. This is one of the greatest curses of mankind. Even the Greeks had a stone they put around their neck to ward it off. It was called, the stone was called amethyst. Amethyst. Amethyst is purple in color. Yeah, but you know what it was supposed to do? It was supposed to keep them getting drunk. Keep them, wanting, keep them desire and drink. All right, Brother Harold. Wine is a mocker. Strong, <laughs> strong drink a brawler. And whoever is intoxicated is, by it is not wise. All right. And 23 and verse 31. He is, uh, <coughs> he is quoting Proverbs 20 and verse 1 and 23 verse 31 and paraphrasing it. Do not, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. All right. At the last it bites like a serpent. That's right. <laughs> What's a serpent do to you? <laughs> he kills you. Yeah. <laughs> Poison. I mean, it is toxic. It, it is poison. What is alcohol to your system? Poison. It's poison. It is. It's poison. Titus 1 and 6. Titus 1 and 6. Titus 1 and 6. Romans 13 and verse 3, David. Have you got your New Testament there? Hey, Pan A, D, Thank you. Have you got one, Harry? Uh, 1 Corinthians 5 and 11. Right. 
Romans 2 and what? Romans uh, 13, 13. Who, has anyone got one of those yet? Have you got one of your own? No. <coughs> Romans 13, 13. Have you got one? Titus 1 and 6. Titus 1 and 6. Namely, if any man be above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of this, dissipation or rebellion. Okay, that word there is drunkenness. <laughs> All right, drunkenness. That's one of the one of the uh, requirements for a pastor is that he's not supposed to be a drunk. Okay. All right, that's that's a good requirement. First Peter four and four. How, how, how about Romans 13 and 13? Uh, do you got that, David? Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. Most crimes committed on the roads are because people are what? Drunk. 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 Most of your thefts and robberies are committed by people that are or drugs or drunk. And what is it? Is there any difference in it? You're drugged. Mm -hmm. Either way, aren't you? You're drugged. You're drugged. I would say 95% of the students that I taught when I was in teaching in prison, all of their crimes were related to getting alcohol or drugs. Yeah. It tears up more families. It dissipates more lives than anything else in the world, I guess. Drunkenness. And I'm going to tell you something about drunkenness back in this time. Back in the Roman and Greek times, their wine and their beverages did not have much alcohol in them. And the idea of a drunk back then was that they had to go drink something until their bellies were completely full. Let it set in there for a while. And the uh, Greeks had vomitoriums where they went in there and they would stick a feather down their throat and make themselves vomit. The first thing that goes in your system from alcohol is, I mean, from wine is alcohol. So they to keep and to get drunk and to get drunker and drunker, they had to disperse. <laughs> and these were drunkards. Once they got drunk, then they could just keep on drinking. But to get drunk, it, it, was, it had to drink a lot of volume. Isn't that pitiful? Now today we have invented a way to get around that, haven't we? <laughs> we can we can take hundred proof. Uh, one of the great writers and well, movie stars. They used to, to to warm up their their scotch and their brandy, and they would take it and they would take a big mouthful of it and they go and suck it in like that so they could get drunk faster. Breathe it into it went through their lungs. Mm. What were they doing? Trying to get drunk faster. I saw my uncles drink vanilla extract, <laughs> mouthwash, just about anything. What all did they drink? They drank everything. Oh, yeah, alcohol. Huh? Rubbing yeah. Rubbing yeah. Rubbing Heroin, shaving rubbing lotion. alcohol, shaving lotion. <laughs> Whatever they could do, yet they had become slaves to this. This is one of the easiest things to become a slave to in the world. Paul, I told you he was going to fall on us, didn't I? <laughs> and he does. I knew a man one time that only took alcohol medicinally, and he was sick every day. <laughs> That's right. He's sick every day. <laughs> I'd take some. You mix yourself from your alcohol. You shake it when you're sick, and I seldom shakes it. Kai me methos keste, and not be caused to be drunk. Literally, what it means is senseless. Why do people commit crimes? Why do you have wrecks when you're drunk? You think you're thinking all right. You've lost you? your equilibrium. You've lost your brains mm -hmm. and your ability to, to, to work, to function. 
Luke 15, 13. All of these, being drunk with the wine. I remember, and I, you've heard me say this before, but I'm going to say it one more time because some of you may not have heard it. I was out in the backyard with my uncle. He was out there. This was my bad uncle, the one that was so mean, Uncle Bill. And my friend Gary Harwell and I were out there playing, and we were throwing dirt clods at each other. We had dug some holes out there, and we had a, about an acre of ground almost. We dug the holes around there, and we'd play in it, and we were throwing dirt clods in there, and we'd act like John Wayne and all those people on these war movies saying, Fire in the hole! When one of them would land in the hole, we'd jump out of there, you know, and go, boom, you know, like it blew up. You know, we were really oh, yeah. acting it all out, you know. Bill run out there, and he said, Who called me a wino? And started trying to kill us, man. <laughs> Start throwing real rocks at us, hard rocks and clubs and brooms, and he's going to kill us because he, he thought we were calling him a wino. Well, he was a wino, but we weren't calling him a wino, but he had a guilty conscience. He thought we were calling him a wino. Don't be a wino, it says. In which is asotia. Asotia. What in the world is asotia? <clears throat> it means desolate without hope. <clears throat> Alcoholics Anonymous. This verse is just right square on this thing. See, I mean, there it is. Alcoholics Anonymous. What do Alcoholics Anonymous tell you to do? Push you up to admit. You have to admit that you're an alcoholic. They get up and when they're at the meetings, they say, I'm an alcoholic. All right. Well, you know, you could get up and say, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners, aren't we? Every one of us are sinners. We could get up and say, I'm a sinner. Well, what do we do as sinners? How many days of the week does God give us? One day at a time. That's what we're supposed to really strive to live through this day the right way. When you're an alcoholic, what does alcohol? You know, they've got how many steps? I can't remember. Oh, I know. I went to these meetings. Twelve steps. I went to these meetings because I had a lot of people I had to deal with like this. Twelve steps, and they had. They say. One day at a time. I remember one of my neighbors in Fish Lake Valley was the sweetest woman in the world. I tell you, but she was a drunk. She drank all the time. But she was a sweetheart. I got down up there one time and I couldn't even walk. I, my back was so bad. I, it was before I had a back operation. I mean, I could hardly get around at all. I was basically paralyzed. She'd come over every day and she'd rub my back, put some liniment on me, and she'd bring me some food. She was a sweetheart. A really sweet woman. And every day she'd come over there drunk. <laughs> she was drunk. She was sweet when she was drunk. She was just a wonderful person. But finally in her life, and I prayed for her all the time. And you know what? She got the mastery of that thing. So my, my wife met her. She was no longer a drunk. <coughs> she's still a sweet person but God didn't remove the attraction to it but he gave her power over it and God does give you power over it because sin immorality greed every one of us makes us a slave doesn't it it makes us a hopeless wretch but in Christ, we have hope, don't we? That word asotia means without hope. That's what the wor this world will do. It will leave you without hope. But be ye filled in the Spirit. Now, when you're a real alcoholic, the last thing you go to bed thinking about is the booze, and when the first thing you get up is to think about where you're going to get the next drink. There are working alcoholics too, you know, but they do like that. They, they, the, the last thing they think about at night is that last drink, and the first thing is that drink. I had a guy tell me one time his mother-in-law came to visit him, and she wouldn't drive when she wouldn't drink when she was on the road. But when she got pulled up out in front of his house, she grabbed her bottle and ran and said, "Give me ice, <laughs> ice." <laughs> She thought it was cool. It wasn't cool. It was slavery. Slavery. 
This is only one of the things that makes a slave out of us, isn't it? Only one of the things. One of the things that makes us a slave. But it tells us be filled with the Spirit of God. Now, if you're going to be filled with the Spirit of God like an alcoholic likes to be with, that, with alcohol, what do you have to do? If you're going to be filled with the Spirit of God, what do you have to do? Take it in. Huh? Take it in. The last thing you think about at night time is what? God. God. The first thing you think about in the morning is what? God. And I'm going to tell you something. Does it replace that other stuff? It can. It can. It can. You follow God's recipe, His instruction manual, and you know what? You can walk off from that stuff. Whatever it is. I mean, tonight, 518 talks about drunkenness. They, they took the amethyst stone. They put it around her neck. They thought... They would have a priest pray over this thing and they'd wear this stone around their neck because they knew they had a problem. 4,000 years ago, there was problems with drunkenness. What did Solomon say? Huh? It'll take everything in this world that you have. I... Uh, I was listening to my brother the other day. We were, I was teaching a lesson. I taught my Sunday school lesson here, and then I taught it again out there in the motor home with a bunch of the country and western singers and stuff was out there, and, and Larry Daniels on and did Buck's eulogy. <coughs> we got out there, and we got to talk, and we got to talk about drunkenness. I said, it used to really make me mad when people would accuse Buck of being drunk. <coughs> I went over there and, and, and listened to his concert. He was drunk. He couldn't hardly talk. He couldn't talk because he couldn't talk. He had several strokes. And he had throat cancer, and they had cut his tongue all to pieces and raided at him, and it was very hard for him to learn how to talk again. And the tireder he got, he would slur his words. And it's, but he could sing still. Which is really unusual. That's just like uh, Mal Tillis. And my brother said something. He said, somebody up in his barbershop, son, he said, that old buck owns an alcoholic. And my brother knows, knew him really well, personally. He said that he could have uh, gone on a tour with Buck Owens because he was all business. But he said, Merle, I could, Haggard asked him to go with him one time. He said, oh, no. <laughs> no way. <laughs> party, party, party. But when Buck went on tour, it was business. He said, I could have done it, but he turned him down anyway. He said, when Merle asked him, he said, no way. <laughs> I can't handle that. My brother told this guy that was asking him, he said, I'm going to ask you something. Is Buck Owens rich? He said, oh, yeah, he's rich. He said, you ever seen a drunk that was very rich? They don't think about it, do they? If it is, it's a, a fluke. Drunkenness will take everything you got away from me. Greed. Ted Kennedy is a good example of that. Huh? Greed. Greed. Just think about that for a while. What are some of the greediest, richest people in the world? Greed. What will it do to you? You won't spend a penny. Now, some of, I tell you what. I walked in a restaurant here a while back and I saw just two people in there. Both of them were millionaires and you'd think they came right off the streets. I mean, the gutter. <laughs> Looked like so tight they wouldn't even wash their clothes. Hmm. Buy any. Just rags. Remember that? Yeah. That greed can do that to you also. Well, this is where I quit in 1976, so that's where I'm going to quit tonight. Well, can I ask a question? Yes. You, you alluded to the fact that the early church would have been aghast at the churches today. Yes. What did you mean? Here, the greed involved in them, oh, the, the, the goals, the goals. What are the goals? Well, the early church would sell their goods and yeah. share. Yeah, they'd share. They were, they were communistic in their ways. They were. What, what is the date? 
Uh, so 12? They would, uh, they so would is it wrong then to have a large church and give lots and lots of money and, and only minister to the Christians? Only minister to the Christians? Isn't I'm that what basically they do? Because you don't get too many just unsafe people walk in. We do, well, here a while back, they had a dinner here, and what people were supposed to go out is get, go out and get a straight person and bring them to the dinner and pay for their dinner and come in and let them hear the gospel. They do that. They do go and they go and work in soup kitchens. They're right now they're in Mexico or South America. I they're know, having I out know things. Churches do things yeah, like that, we, but they're all all the time. But, but what I'm talking about is the is the greed, the fluence that we strive for today. Retiring when you're thirty years old. And living on a beach and get one of them little drinks with umbrellas in it and just living away your life in leisure. Wasting your life. <laughs> one of the worst alcoholics I've ever known started the rescue mission here in Bakersfield. He did just exactly what you did. He would take that scotch yep. before he got saved. Mm -hmm. One of the people that I worked with out in Southern Refinery he was an alcoholic, just an absolute gutter bum. Just a gutter bum. And he worked his whole ministry. His, his mother wanted him to be a minister. Well, he was. But you know where he worked? At alcoholics, at the AA canteens. That's where he worked. He spent his life down there helping others to shake loose of what, he, what, had, what had him, what had control over him. You can do I mean... Ministries. Ministries. How could you, how can you tonight go out and redeem the time? What can you do to redeem the rest of your life? To witness. Witness. How can you do it? Talk to your neighbor. Talk to your neighbor. First of all, you got to walk straight. Isn't that what it tells us? Walk straight. You know what, you know the people that you know, I thought you were supposed to control her that back there, but John, so I thought you back there. <laughs> you got to walk. You got to walk the walk. And when you walk the walk, you can deal with people. How can you help people? By letting God work through you. By letting God work through you, and and using your experiences. Why? If you're an alcoholic, you would help. You can help alcoholic people. If you were a gambler, you could help gamblers. You know, they got gamblers and all it's just like they got alcoholics and all And they've got these things for, for, you know, pornography. All of these areas, there is an area of service to do. And the first person you deal with when you're saved, when Jesus saved the gathering demoniac, what did the gathering demoniac wanted to do, want to do? Tell everybody about it. What did he want to do? What did you remember? What he wanted that demoniac wanted to do? He was no more, longer a demoniac. He set up the temple and worship God right there. No. What did he want to do? Come on, remember, help you remember. He said, "Lord, I'll follow you anywhere." He said, "No, you can't." What did he tell him to do? He went to preach. He said, "You go back home where you came from, and you tell them about me." And you know where he came from? The area of what we call Decapolis. Decapolis means ten cities. And that's where, the, where a great... The Roman road went to Decapolis. And you know what was all along those, those, that Roman road after that man went back? Churches. That was an absolute fertile area for the churches to go through later. They went in and established church after church after church. Sometimes they would take over the heathen temples and make them into churches. Why? Because that rascal was changed. They saw his life changed. And by his changed life, he didn't follow Jesus. He just went back home and told them what happened to him. And told them about Jesus. And it changed people's lives. And it does. It changes people's lives. 
Anybody ever sorry they were ever saved? Ever hear anybody like that? You ever hear anybody ever sorry that they were a gambler, alcoholic, a pornographer, whoremonger, or whatever? A lot of people are sorry for that, but never anybody sorry for following the Lord. The Lord doesn't lead you astray. Thank you for your attention tonight. We ran over a little bit. We started early, so we quit late to make up for it. <laughs> Brother John, would you dismiss us in prayer, brother? Lord, we thank you once again. Uh, tonight, what we have learned and what, have you, what you've done to touch our hearts. Uh, help us to spread the word about how you have told Paul to tell us not to do certain things in our lives and to shine for you. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. John, you've been a faithful, faithful student here for a long, long time. The beans are written that you might believe in Jesus and the Christ. The yes, Son, and that believing you might have eternal life. Yeah, eternal life. You might have life. And life more abundant. Do you think we still ought to go to the book of James? If Paul was this rough. <laughs> Jim, you just didn't get getting warmed up. <laughs> Uh huh. And I got somewhere. I don't know where it is, but I'll find it. Okay. All right. I do. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You ever drive on this? John, you have to stop that baby on gasoline. I'm running around or two and got warm up and then switch it over to over the diesel. Yeah. And uh, no, I have. I've never run one. But uh, my wife thought took about three or four rounds to get warmed up. Yeah. Well, remember the old ponies. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. Like your old John Deere. You just get warmed up. Start. Yeah, yeah, the pony. Oh, you're a youngster, really. <laughs> <laughs> what? You're a youngster. Yeah. He knew the name. He doesn't know it personally, but he knew the name. He said he's had a lot of patients now. Who's that? I don't know. I don't think you're very good.